Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our first ever Cincinnati Bearcats basketball show. We are live from the Walter E. and Marilyn Bartlett Television Center here at CCM on the campus of the University of Cincinnati. I am Alex Frank, and I am joined tonight by Justin Cashman and Sean McMahon. Guys, first off, how are you doing? And this is really exciting. Our first ever basketball show for what I think is going to be an exciting season. Yeah, I'm doing pretty good tonight. I would say I'm definitely pumped. The, the renovation of the Fifth Third Arena, I can't wait to see that get unveiled, especially since our first game is against Ohio State. Big time game. I hope we win, obviously. But, uh, you know, I hope, you know, we, we ended last season on a, on a bad note. Hopefully we can start off on a good one and we can keep, the, we can keep it rolling and hopefully we can keep winning. I'm doing great. Obviously, the Cincinnati lost some really key players, and I can't wait to see who's going to step up and uh, show who's going to be the starters for Ohio against Ohio State once the season rolls around. I think that's an interesting point, Justin, you bring up, because they lost Gary Clark and Kyle Washington, two very important players, two of the best to ever come through the program, especially under Mick Cronin. But the exciting part to me about this year Well, is, don't forget Jacob Evans, too. Oh, absolutely. My favorite player on last year. No bias trying to show here. But I think what Justin said is the exciting part is you don't know how this team is going to be or what they're going to be, how they're going to do whatever. You know, there's not expectations like there were last year of, you know, the fact that they actually succeeded in the regular season. In the postseason, it's a different story, and you hit on that, Sean. But the exciting part is the potential of who's going to replace those legendary players and what's going to become of it. Now, just recently, the Bearcats were picked to finish second in the American Athletic Conference coaches preseason poll that was unveiled Monday at the conference's media days in Philadelphia. The Bearcats picked to finish second behind Central Florida. Were you, How did you react to that? Were you surprised did you expect that I was definitely surprised by that I didn't realize that UCF you know going into the preseason I didn't realize they would be such a you know I, I don't know how what would you say powerhouse was that how you would say it I think you could say that yeah I just I didn't expect them to you know for them to be on top of the AAC especially since we dominated last year but again you go back to the fact that we lost three key players but you know Hopefully, Coach Cronin has got these guys ready to go for the season. Hopefully, that's not the case where we do finish second. I want to finish first. Absolutely. Were and you after, about to say something? And after coming off two straight 30-win 30, 30 seasons and with players such as Jaron Cumberland to come start and show up, um, it definitely comes as a surprise after UCF finishes only 19-13 and 13 last year. They have some key players like 7-6 Taco Fall going to uh, definitely step up for them this season, but it does, definitely does come out of surprise that Cincinnati was picked to finish second. Yeah, you're right, 19 and 13. But let's not forget with Central Florida last year, and you and I, Justin, were talking about this earlier today. Taco Fall gets hurt in late January. He had been battling shoulder problems all season, finally decided to have shoulder surgery late January, missed the rest of the season. He wasn't there when the Bearcats played Central Florida in February, a game won by the Bearcats by a wide margin. It was over 30. I don't remember the yep. exact score. But I'm telling you right now, you look at UCF, they they return eight of t eight of their top ten scores. Eight of their top ten scores. That right there tells you they're going to be, on paper, tough to beat. Now, games are played on court. Thankfully, if you're Cincinnati, you got nine letter winners, four starters from a squad that won 19 games. And if they hadn't had the injuries to Taco Fall and Aubrey Dawkins, I guarantee you they could have won a few more games and maybe been a little more competitive in the conference. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, the AAC, the the uh, the championship game, or the regular season game against Wichita State, it would have been really interesting to see going in uh, before that to see another uh, team from the East, from the AAC East, try and compete with us and try to be at the top and try and be the best at the season, and even in the tournament, too. And you kind of mentioned how they're retaining a lot of their starters, but... Cincinnati is retaining two of their great starters, Jaron Cumberland and uh, Justin Jennifer. But then we're definitely going to have a lot of people going to step up this year, like Nysir Brooks, Trey Scott, Kane Broom. Definitely going to be some key players for this upcoming season. Kane Broom did have a decent season last year. But a lot of people actually thought he might have started, uh, averaging 7.9 points, shot 46.3%. Um, 
So, yeah, he was definitely a key player for us last year. There were games last year where the Bearcats won, and I think Kane Broom was the reason why they did. I remember the Tulsa game, senior day. And Tulsa was a very good team last year. They finished fourth in the conference, always exceed expectations in the preseason. I think that's a credit to Frank Haith, the head coach. But in that game, Kane Broom had almost 20 points, and his three-point shooting lifted the Bearcats offensively. He is a spark. I said it all last season. And I'm one of those people, Justin, who said Kane Broom needs to start. Because as great as Justin Jennifer is and not turning the ball over, who would you rather have? A guy that doesn't turn the ball over but doesn't score? Or a guy who, despite turning the ball over maybe a few times too many, but can also really score? That's Kane Broom. And this year... Without your most potent offensive players, Evans, who was so good in so many ways, Clark and Washington, you're going to need someone to score the basketball besides Jaron Cumberland because I guarantee you teams are going to game plan to limit his abilities. Who are you going to go to? Kane Broom. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, Kane Broom and Justin Jennifer, I think they're both two really good players, but to me it's who is going to prove themselves on the court, not just their numbers because sometimes numbers don't really mean a whole lot. So to me it's... It's going to be interesting to see this season how that all plays out with those two. Hopefully they both start on the same court uh, against Ohio State, and hopefully it continues for the rest of the season. You're talking about Broom and Cumberland? and No, I'm sorry, Justin Jennifer and uh, Kane Broom. Hopefully, I think, that, I think they should both start personally. Yes, I agree with you on that. Now, and two, um, other players that we haven't talked about yet that I think could be valuable players. Trevor Moore, who I'm looking here, shot... Where is it? 31.7% from three. Not a great percentage, but with him getting more minutes this year, I think he could be a valuable weapon off the bench. And then you look at guys like Keith Williams, Ilya Sosome, and then you have guys, and then you even have the newcomers. Uh, they list Athlon Sports list Mamadou DR as a newcomer. He was here last year, so I really don't get that. But I'm looking at Rayshon Fredericks, Laquil Hardnett, and Logan Johnson. I mean, I think the freshmen are going to get more minutes than what could be expected. And I do think, you know, these aren't small shoes to fill, guys. Gary Clark was a two-time Defensive Player of the Year in the conference and the Player of the Year overall last year. And Kyle Washington was, what was he, Justin, a second team or uh, honorable mention last year I believe he in was, the American. I believe he was honorable mention. Honorable mention, but nonetheless, but, he was still he was still a great player. Exactly, yeah. great in the post and great on defense. There was a sequence in the Georgia State game last year in the tournament. I'll never forget it. He blocked a dunk and then hit a three at the other end, changed the whole course of the game. These are big shoes to fill, but I think they can be. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the thing with with uh, Kyle Washington and uh, Gary Clark and even Jacob Evans is that like they were key on defense, not just offense. So they not only could they score, but they could keep the other team from scoring too especially Gary Clark. I mean, there you could go back and you could find so many highlights of him just blocking shots left and right. The and, one at UCLA. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And not only that, but, like, Coach Crona is definitely a defensive scheme kind of coach. He, he, he really focuses on defense, which I like. I like that a lot. I love that we have schemes to try and get the ball back and try and score on offense. Going to his and going Coach Cronin going into his 13th season, he knows what he's looking for. He knows what he's looking for going for defensive players uh, definitely. But a lot of these guys are two way players. Kane Broom is definitely someone who can shoot the basketball. Jaron Cumberland is someone who can definitely score, averaging 11.5 points last year. So he definitely knows what he's looking for. So, def but definitely they are a great uh, defensive team. Even as a freshman, Jaron Cumberland was still scoring. He averaged, I think, 8.3 points a game. He was named Coast Sixth Man of the Year in the American Athletic Conference. And you're right, Sean. Third, you like that McCronin, you know, really uh, puts a lot of time and invests so much in being a great defensive minded coach. Fifty seven and a half points a game the Bearcats allowed last year. Yeah, that's pretty that's pretty good my, in my mind. It's insane. And you need that to win, oh, I yeah. think, in the conference now. I think defense wins championships, personally. That's what I say. I think that applies to a lot of sports. I, I think it it does win you championships, I think, in football. Basketball, eh, it might. But I mean, you have to score too. But like, yeah, I mean, look at Villanova last year. Yeah, at times they were unbelievable. So, we, you guys hit on it a lot, uh, or we have so far. Jaron Cumberland, and he is our player spotlight tonight. 
he's going to be the leader of this team. Absolutely, I agree because he's he's he has the most experience out of anybody. I think. Uh, what was his freshman season? Was it 2016? Yeah, yeah. I guess I remember watching him in the crosstown shootout. I remember watching how good he was, and just you knew that eventually he was going to turn into a into a great starter, and hopefully he can be a team leader because um, with Gary Clark and uh, Jacob Evans and Kyle Washington, those guys weren't just like great at basketball. They were great leaders too. You know, they got the team motivated and, and hopefully Jaron Cumberland can do the same with his experience with those guys. It's going to take a lot for Jaron Cumberland to develop this year because I read an article uh, back in June with Shannon Russell, who writes for The Athletic, and Cumberland talked about how he doesn't really like talking to the press. Mm-hmm. Well, being a, now that he's this team's best player, in my opinion, he's going to be talking to the press I, almost, if not after every game. Right. So being a leader is being able to you know, speak on other players' behalves and take ownership. And you're going to have to hold yourself highly accountable. That's how you say it. Because... The media is going to ask to talk to him after every game, whether he has a good one or a bad one. Yeah, he's reserved. He's definitely a reserved player. Justin, your thoughts? Definitely last year as a sophomore, he kind of helped carry this team. He's a big body, but he can take it out. He uh, did tie tie teammate Jacob Evans with uh, team high 63-pointers. So he's definitely going to be a key, pivotal player. Um, But yeah, he is a reserved guy. Definitely doesn't want to talk to the media the whole time, but... Uh, being the MVP of this team, most likely would be my guess is he's going to be talking to the media after almost every game. Well, not an interesting point you bring up there is him tying Jacob Evans for what team high in three pointers 60. and sixty. Yes, last year, let's say Evans was in a slump, or Ka- or Clark and or Washington were in a slump. Cumberland picked up the slack. Mm-hmm. They don't win the Georgia State game in the tournament without him. I, I'm telling you right now, they don't win that tournament game without him. 27 points. Yeah. Come, go ahead. Absolutely. No, no, no. I was just I was just agreeing with you. Yeah, definitely at times he would carry this team and uh, definitely showed that even as a sophomore, he was definitely one of the pivotal, player, pivotal players while Gary or Evans or Washington, we all know what those guys could do, but then Cumberland would also come in and definitely contribute a whole lot. Yeah, and you knew right away, Sean said it earlier in the Crosstown shootout his freshman year. I remember watching him. He, he was electric in the second half, and that team was led – from with players like Troy Copain, Oct- uh, was Octavius Ellis on that team? You know, I don't remember actually. I want to look that up I right now I because I, I know Quadri Moore was. Yeah, Quadri Moore. You had uh, Justin Jennifer. You had uh, Gary Clark was on that team. That was when John Rothstein uh, said that he was a problem. Mm-hmm. Apologize for the lights there. We're having a little issue there. For those of you that are going to watch this eventually, but Jaron Cumberland, you knew right away was going to be a real valuable asset to this team. I saw him. Uh, me having graduated from Springboro High School, I saw him play at Wilmington in the district All Star game, and he he you know he he was this real big guy with you know big biceps and whatnot. Another thing, you know, we talked about him talking in the media. You know, I actually support what he says because let's say someone else has a great game, he should be the one talking, not the. Not him if he like only has a mediocre game. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, despite the fact that he's reserved, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You know, like there's nothing wrong with being a reserve player because sometimes guys that are too talkative are just that. They're just too talkative and they might say a little too much or, you know, they might be a little cocky. But I think Jaron handles things uh, maturely. I think he does anyway. It's kind of like a Kawhi Leonard, very quiet guy, very reserved, but uh, he does all the talking with his game. He doesn't want to talk and hype himself up, but he wants to show what he can do out on the court. I agree with that. I'm trying to see if Octavius Ellis was not on that team. I believe his last season was 2016 and didn't end, obviously, the way he would have wanted to with that dunk that he did not get Mm -hmm. in in time against St. Joseph's in the... Uh, first round of the tournament so I think we've established Jaron Cumberland is going to be the key player to this team he's going to have to carry a big load I mean you know he's going to have to go out there and have let's say 20 points a night but I think having guys develop around him like a Kane Broom like a Justin Jennifer like Trevor Moore and even some of the newcomers Fredericks, Harnett and Johnson so we talked about it earlier 
um, replacing Gary and Kyle. It won't be easy. Not by any extent, no. They were both big, and they were both physical, and they could both score. They could both play a phenomenal defense, too. Also, someone who's very physical is Nicer Brooks, who they expect to step in for Kyle Washington. Um, while he did only average 2.6 points, 2.3 rebounds, but um, – he only, I mean, he only averaged 9.7 minutes, so definitely with some more playing time this year, it's going to be interesting to see what he's going to be able to do. Yeah, and I think for freshmen too, it's 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 what can Coach Cronin do with these guys? How can he prepare them to step up to be in the limelight, so to speak? You know, because I think, you know, it's not just necessarily a, a star rating thing. You know, you could probably bring a guy in as a two-star that doesn't always matter. They can turn into, you know, some great players. So it's I think it's a matter of what Coach Cronin can teach these guys since he's been doing this for so many years. He's been involved with this program for so many years. So whatever he can, you know, wisdom, I guess you could say, he could bestow on them, I think that's going to be the key factor. Yeah, Mick Cronin, and this was something I read in Athlon Sports yesterday, talked about how this he refers to his program as a developmental program. And it says in this magazine, which means that he takes players who fly under the, the recruiting radar and over the course of three to five years develops them into solid veterans. Yeah, I agree. I mean, he, he's even proved it before with tons of players. So, I mean, I, I think he's a great coach. Look at Sean Kilpatrick. Years. Look at Justin Jackson. Remember yeah. Justin Jackson mm-hmm. on those Absolutely. teams? You know, when Kilpatrick was here, yep. Troy Copain. Yep. I mean, you know, back in the 90s, in early 2000s, the Bearcats were one of the premier teams. Yep. Now, something interesting, and I didn't put this down on the show lineup, but because we pretty much hit on everything that I had planned out for tonight, I want to hit on this. If UC was in the Big East today. Ooh. I like where this is going. If they. Justin, do you have a thought on that? If they're in the Big East? Yeah. Uh, I definitely think uh, it would be a challenge, but I definitely think they fit well in the AAC. There is a lot of competition. Um I mean, they're second right now behind UCF, but uh, Big East was definitely a definitely a uh, difficult division or a difficult conference, excuse me. Um, so I think they would still fare fare pretty well, being if they were in the Big East. I mean, and especially with the new arena. I mean, both Louisville and Cincinnati got new arenas, and then now they're not even in the the Big East. The Big East Conference was the premier college basketball conference. I agree. I mean, now when you say the Big East, were you talking the old Big East or the Big East right now with like Xavier? Oh no, and I'm, ta- I'm talking the old Big East. Oh, the okay, the old Big East with Syracuse. Um, oh yeah, no, it would still be just as competitive, still just as exciting to watch for sure. The Big East, not even just in basketball and football, the Big East was like easily one of the most competitive conferences, and they weren't a Power Five conference, but no, they might as well have been, right? Power Six. I think conference. they should have. I mean, you remember 2009 when the Bearcats and Pittsburgh played for the the Big East Championship, right? One of the most exciting college football games I think we've all. Did you watch? I don't think the I game have, being I being I... from Columbus <laughs> for that other team. Yeah, 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 yeah whatever. North. Um, yeah. but I mean, you and I talked about it, Sean, before our our pregame show. I mean, Sean McDonough's call on uh Benz's game winning touchdown was incredible. It's a classic. It is. It's an absolute classic, and. You know, the thing about the Big East was that, like, they weren't a Power 5 conference, but they were treated like it because the winner of the B- of the uh, the Big East uh, championship game got a bowl berth versus other, you know, not Power 5 conferences such as, you know, the Midwest Conference or Conference USA or whoever it may be. They didn't get a bowl berth, but the Big East did. You know, Big that's East. that was the interesting thing about it. It did. And, I mean, you look at UConn in 2010, they were, I believe, 8-4. And still went, excuse me, to the Fiesta Bowl. So, UConn used to be a powerhouse in football, an absolute powerhouse. Now, I mean, they could they could come back on a rise, but yeah, know, we'll see. They could. It's but, interesting to see now that Syracuse, they used to be just a basketball school. Now they're upsetting Clemson, it seems like, almost this last year. And then they almost beat them this year. Now Cincinnati. And Clemson. Yeah, Cincinnati is now a good f- football team and a good basketball team, obviously. So... The spark for Syracuse was the Virginia Tech game, I believe in 2015, was it, when they beat Virginia Tech, and then they beat Clemson last year. So, no, it was 2016. It had to have been 2016. When they beat Virginia Tech? When they beat Virginia Tech, because I remember Virginia Tech was heavily favored, and Dino Babers gave that, like, amazing uh, post-game speech in the locker room. I want to look this up. It's a great video. Let's I highly see. recommend it. Let's see. It's funny. Dino Babers is is a great college football coach just because the way he gets his players well, hyped they up. they did. Okay, yes, this was uh, in 2016. Syracuse 
be a number 17 Virginia Tech team, 31 to 17. Now, that was Virginia Tech's first year without the legendary Frank Beamer, so that might have had something to do with it, but I do agree with your point. I mean, if the Big East was still in existence today, I mean, top 25 matchups in the new arena every week. I mean, you know, the Big East, every Saturday, the featured 1 o'clock afternoon and Saturday night game was almost always the Big East. And the tournament was the premier tournament. Madison Square Garden, ESPN, lights are on. Historic matchups. I agree. I miss the Big East so much, too. I know. I miss the Big East. It was just such a great conference to be a part of just because you were treated like you were in a Power 5 conference. And the Bearcats were actually good in in the last three years they were in him. They went to the Big East title game in 2012, actually beat Syracuse, who was number one, I believe, in the division. Mm -hmm. And, or conference, excuse me, went on to a number one seed in the tournament. And Cincinnati went to the Sweet 16. So I just thought we'd hit on that. You know, talking about how, you know, it'd be interesting to see if the Big East was still around today. Mm-hmm. You remember games like when Kemba Walker hit the uh, buzzer beater oh. at Madison Square Garden. Oh, yeah. They left UConn. Mm-hmm. Cardiac Kemba. I believe Dave Pash was on the call uh, for that game. I believe he was. was I don't Sy- remember. Was that Syracuse they played? Well, uh, the game where he hit the step back jumper, yeah. that was Pittsburgh. That was Pittsburgh. Correct. But then yeah. other games, Syracuse, UConn. Remember the six overtime game? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I do. I remember that. That was crazy. Syracuse. Um, well, also. Pitt is another thing because I miss the Big East for reasons because because we would play Louisville and we would play Pitt. I miss playing those those you know those rivalries. I miss the River City rivalry and the Keg of Nails rivalry. I miss that. We don't play Pitt in football until 2023. It's gonna be a while before we play those guys, and I kind of miss. That's what I miss about the Big East was the rivalries that were in it. You know, obviously with the AAC, you have teams like. USF and UCF in football and, you know, in basketball, it's Houston and UCF and, you know, but it's still not the same. It's still not the same, you know, intense rivalry as it is with like Pittsburgh or Louisville or even Xavier for that matter, especially Xavier. Well, yeah, I mean, even though Xavier never was in UC's conference to begin with, they were never in the Big East when UC was in it. They Mm -hmm. are now, but UC is in the American. So deviating from that, the conference this year, I think it's really strong, and I said I thought it last year. I just want to I just want to get your thoughts on the conference this season. Oh man, I think the conference this season is going to be really competitive because, you know, you've got who like Wichita State, you've got Houston, you've got Cincinnati, you've got UCF, Memphis, Memphis just hired Penny Hardaway. Yeah, and hope maybe Tulsa might even again like you said might exceed expectations like they sometimes do. So there's six teams right there. You know, other teams might surprise us. Who knows? So this year it'll definitely be competitive. We'll have a lot of good teams probably make it to the uh, to March Madness. Yeah, hopefully def- past the second round for us. <laughs> yeah, definitely going hopefully. off of what Sean said. It's definitely going to be very difficult. But I think the Bearcats have definitely enough what it have enough what it takes to win this com- or win this division conference. Excuse me. Um, especially with great defense. Obviously there were games like last year nail biter against Houston so uh that's definitely a team that might give us some trouble but I think they have enough what it takes to beat teams like UCF I think so too because remember games aren't played on paper and UCF hasn't you know they haven't made the tournament since 2005 that was before Mick Cronin got really? here it's a long time wow <laughs> 14 years when I when I look at this conference I think you know uh every game is a battle in this conference, because these conferences play defense, is very difficult to score. Look at the games. Look, look at the games in years past. I mean, there's not a whole lot of scoring. I mean, the the tournament championship game last year, I think both teams scored less than 25 points in the second half. Mm-hmm. That's because that's because all these schools know how to play defense. I think it is going to be competitive. Wichita State, though, uh, my notes on them, I have that. Where where is it? They are returning only 11.2% of minutes from last year. Wow. That's, That's incredibly small. That's amazing. I mean, you look at who left. Landry Shamit, uh, Shaquille Morris. I mean, last year it was UC and Wichita State at the top. Houston did give both teams a run for their money a little bit. Houston actually beat Wichita State in the semifinals of the tournament. And Wichita State beat us at home and ended our home streak. 
Yes, but that? we got revenge on the road. We did. In a real tough game to win. If they beat us, would they have shared the title, or was that an they outright win? Sh- we would have shared the title, would, and okay. they would have been the number one seed in the tournament. Okay, that's what I thought it was. And we probably wouldn't have been the two seed in the NCAA tournament had that happened. But we don't have to worry about that because we know what did. Um, You look at Greg Marshall and the fact that he has an A20 winning percentage since 2010 – you know, only two schools, Gonzaga and Kansas, have better winning percentages in that time span. This is going to be his toughest year. But then look at Penny Hardaway and Memphis. You know, Memphis, little do we all know, 10 years ago was minutes, seconds away from a national championship mm-hmm. against Kansas. So, and then even the schools at the bottom of the conference, I mean, I'm looking at... UConn. Yeah, UConn. UConn won in 2014. They yeah. won the. They have won the whole tournament. They won the national championship. And they won a tournament in this conference. Oh, yeah. I mean, Dan Hurley hopefully will restore something there. I mean, Jalen Adams is probably one of the most exciting players in this conference, along with Christian Vitale. You look at, and even teams like SMU, hampered with injuries last year, you know they've always had good teams. And then, you know, Tulane, East Carolina, South Florida, I mean, those games are always trip-up games. I mean, I was thinking last year when UC was undefeated in the conference play at 12-0 and that... They could was it twelve and zero? Yeah, I was thinking, what if they're sixteen and zero? They go into Tulane with a Wichita State game in front of them. Mm-hmm. What if what if they lose that game because they overlook it? I mean, that that's it goes back to you can't overlook any game in this conference. Never, it's conference play. Conference play is competitive. Sorry, Justin, you go ahead. I was, in any sport, you can never look past even the teams that don't necessarily have the best records. Any game, any win is hard. It's any win is hard to earn. So it's definitely like. Yeah, the team may be at the bottom record-wise, but you have to take them as seriously as the top. You can never take any game for granted. So UNBC and Virginia. Yeah, that's a good example right there. Well, that's a. By the way, Jaron Cumberland named to the All Preseason First Team in the conference and was selected as one of the 20 players to the Jerry West Shooting Guard of the Year watch list. That whole list is on GoBearCats.com. It's an article uh, titled Cumberland named to Jerry West Award watch list. And there are some uh, notable players on that list from some really notable guard-heavy schools. So quite a big honor for Jaron Cumberland, uh, both actually being named to the Jerry West Award and to the all-preseason first team. Justin. So we're gonna kind of wrap things up here. Are you gonna say something? I would say it's definitely deserved, though. It's not. It's not a fluke at all. Uh, he's definitely gonna be have to have a big role. Definitely having to step up, to, step up this year and uh, show that he is gonna be one of the best guards in the nation. You know, I was gonna say this. I you know, when we talk about how tough it is in conference play. Remember the Temple game in Philadelphia last and year. And uh, Jacob Evans had hit yes. the game winning shot. But yeah. the Bearcats trailed by a lot in the second half. Mm-hmm. Temple's one of those teams. Final season for head coach Fran Dunphy. That's another one of those teams where if you are not at the top of your game, they can easily win that game. They should have beaten Cincinnati in Philadelphia last year. Now, Cincinnati won huge at home against them. But, I mean, he got a preseason first-team member in Quentin Rose. I'm telling you, don't sleep on Temple this year. Never. And don't sleep on Temple Saturday in football. Oh, no, definitely. It'll be a battle in the trenches again this 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 week. It'll be tough. Tem- uh, Temple's got a pretty good defense. The running back's pretty good. They have a pretty good offense. It'll be interesting to see how we respond and how Coach Fickle's adapted. Off the bye weekend, a great head coach in Temple and Jeff Collins. So final question before we wrap things up, and we'll be back for our next show, which is going to be our hour-long basketball preview special. What in your mind constitutes a successful season? Oh, man, I don't even know where to begin. I would definitely say one key thing to having a successful season would be winning the Crosstown Shootout winning big games and also just doing well in the conference. You know, it doesn't have to necessarily be that we outright win, like last year where we outright win the conference in the regular season and in the tournament. But if we can just have a good year and, you know, beat Ohio State, beat UCLA and beat Xavier and just make it to the tournament and make it pretty far in the tournament, I would consider it a pretty good year. Yeah, big games early in the season, such as Ohio State, those are going to be pivotal for the rest of the season to kind of set the tone and see where this team's at. Definitely show that they're good defensively as they have been all the other years, and Jared, Jared Cumberland to set the tone early and show that he is one of the top guards in the nation. And I think at least 25 wins on the season would definitely uh, definitely be a great, a great goal to set 
for the for this season. I agree with both of you, but I think the thing that I want to see is just battling each and every game. You know, I want to see first of all if there's going to be a hangover from last year's tournament loss against Nevada. I don't think there will be. I it, you didn't see it last year against UCLA. They got up to a scorching start. I mean, they had you know final four aspirations surrounding them. Now, is that going to be the only thing that constitutes a successful season for me? No, because this team, I don't know if they are capable of getting to the Final Four. I think they can, but I shouldn't say I don't think they're capable. I, I, I just don't know. I think beating Xavier, obviously, at home in a new arena. I cannot wait for that. Uh, that's going to be that. a battle. I cannot wait for that. Especially because Xavier also lost a lot of players to Trayvon Blewett yep. and J.P. Makura. Makura, yep. So... That, I think, what you said, Sean, beating Xavier. I also think finishing in the top three in the conference. Because this is one of those conferences where, unfortunately, if you don't finish in the top three, you're going to have to at least make it far in the conference tournament to get a possible at-large berth in the tournament, if not winning, which would grant you the automatic berth. I think, you know, what would ultimately, what would ultimately constitute a successful season is getting to the Sweet 16. I would agree with that. It's been a while since we've been to the Sweet 16. Little known fact, last time the Final Four was in Minneapolis, which is where it is this year, was in 1992. Guess who was in it? The Bearcats. Thank you. And I think we'll end with that. Thank you for watching, and go Bearcats.